uh, day. David uh, is uh, known to a number of you who are guests in the audience, I know, and we look forward to it very much. David, we've made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund. Uh, in your name is a way to say thanks for speaking to us today. Uh, and um, I'll remind you all that the mics are in the back if you have questions after he's finished. Um, David actually uh, joined UW Wisconsin uh, in the, uh, as the head of the reference department in Memorial Library in 1994. Um, he is uh, now the director of the University Archives and Records Management uh, program at UW Madison, has been since 2005, actually was acting uh, in that role between 2002 and 2005 holds a BA degree in history from what is now the University of Central Missouri, and two MA degrees, uh, one in history from the College of William and Mary, and the other from the Graduate Library School at the University of Chicago. Before coming to UW, he worked in Miami, Ohio. He worked for 10 years at the University of New Mexico, uh, and he was, among other things, acting head of the Center for Southwest Research, Special Collections and Archives, even as he was responsible for coordinating the social science collection development, which is selected for history materials and as a reference librarian. So he comes with a lot of experience in library and archives. He might even explain the difference between the two <laughs> to you. Uh, and um, we're happy to hear you. David, welcome. Thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. I'm going to go through and say a little bit about what we are at the UW-Madison Archives, what we do, and how things are changing, not just for us, but for our all archives as we transition into a digital world. Um, so we are often confused with the Wisconsin Historical Society archives, which we are not. Um, technically, the Historical Society is responsible for the records of all state agencies, but many years ago in state statutes, they gave the universities the right to have their own official archives. So all of the university campuses have their own archives. We are the official repository for the Madison campus, um, for the university before there was anything but the Madison campus. And I use this photo partly also as a cautionary tale about photographs. This photo of Camp Randall from 1900, not only, we think this was taken from Bascom, but not only is perspective often difficult in old photos, it's hard to tell how many streets there are and what buildings are on what streets, but people tend to think things have always been the way they are, but Camp Randall originally sat east and west. And in 1915, after a bleacher collapse and general just deterioration, the university built a new stadium and they swung it over to where it is today on sitting north and south. So when you look at that photo, you don't think you're looking at one way and you're not looking the way you think you are. So there are a lot of interesting things about photos. I have a copy of it up here if you want to look at it afterwards. We're also the repository for system administration, so people like the Board of Regents, other system offices. This is the Board of Regents from 1924. For those of you who are familiar with the university, I don't know how this will work, may I just talk. The, the person, the second person on the right with the white hair and the mustache is President Burge. Next to him is Zona Gale, the Wisconsin author. Next to her is Liz Waters from Liz Waters' dorm. Um, the person holding his hat down is Theodore Cronsage from the Cronsage dorms. Um, Sometime we're going to do like an online game of match the building with the person because a lot of students go like, oh, there was a Sterling? There was, you know, they don't understand that. Um, we're also the official repository for UW colleges and UW extensions. So we have a huge amount of material, everything from county extension reports from 1915, huge amount of material on WHA radio, WPT. So we sort of cover a lot of area. We have over 27,000 cubic feet of paper material. Archivists love to talk about cubic feet. As far as I know, we don't have any containers that actually are a cubic foot. But um, <laughs> if you think of a small banker's box or a Xerox paper box, that's essentially what we mean as a cubic foot. The university also has 37,000 other containers out at the State Records Center. Most of that material will never come to the archives. Most of that's material that just has a limited lifespan and can be destroyed. But some of that will make its way to the archives. We also get donations. We get faculty papers. Faculty papers are considered property of the faculty members, so they can sort of do whatever they want to with them. But that's what we have in paper. We have over two and a half million images on the history of the university. Um, 1,400 oral histories. The oral history program started out as sort of to help write the last two volumes of the big four volume history of the university. And it's an ongoing program. We've digitized all of these now, so it's much easier to send them out and do some other things with them, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, 
a huge amount of media in all types, media is an issue. Um, some of these types of things, we have machines that we can read them, listen to them. Some we don't. Some we can digitize. Many we can't. You can pretty much pay to have any of this digitized, but it costs a lot of money, a lot more than people tend to think. And the other thing, particularly about video and audio, is it digitizes in real time. So if you have 25,000 hours of oral histories on cassettes, it takes 25,000 hours to digitize those. You can't, you cannot speed that process up. We don't have that many oral histories of this, but probably if we looked at everything, we do. So media is an issue for all archives. We also have a lot of objects. There isn't um, a university history museum on campus, so people give us a lot of things. We're not really set up to be a museum, but if we don't take those things, a lot of people won't. So, for example, the medal on the left was given to Stephen Babcock by the state of Wisconsin in 1899. The cup was given to John Bascom by former students. A lot of just Wisconsin things, that's a pendant probably from the 40s when they used like mean Bucky, who, you know. Then we went to a kinder and gentler Bucky, and now we're kind of back to a mean Bucky again. Um, but objects are difficult to figure out what to do with, and it's been an issue for us. We serve a wide range of people, everything from students coming in to write a two-page paper about a building or something. Lots of off-campus researchers, we get email from all over the world. As an example, there's a woman coming this afternoon from Stanford to spend a couple of days looking at Ira Baldwin's papers. Baldwin was a bacteriologist and an administrator on campus, but he also ran the um, chemical warfare service for the federal government during World War II, and so she's coming in to look at his information on that. Um, we work with a lot of university units. Um, Granger Hall is now doing a timeline of the School of Business, and we're working with them. Space Sciences is having an anniversary. And then just a lot of people who are doing things like either family history or they're writing an article on someone who went to the university. When Ed and I were first meeting to talk about this talk, a woman came in looking for information on her father who was in the farm short course in 1949. So we serve people all over the place at a wide variety of patrons. Um, I want to talk a little about how some of those things are changing. So for example, in terms of sheer numbers, the biggest question we get are people looking for course descriptions. You know, someone goes back to school after five years, after 30 years, and they're trying to get whatever school they're going to now to accept their Econ 320 course and for that. And at the moment, we can just go to the paper copies, we scan them on a photocopier, and we send them off to them. The university no longer prints a catalog. That's only kept in a database. So. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when someone needs a description of a course they took in 2015, who has that? Who gives that to them? That will probably be in a data warehouse someplace. Who will search that? Who will give that to those people? This need is not going to go away, but the way we fill that need for people is going to be very different. Um, and I might say that's probably about as groovy of a cover for a timetable as you will ever see. Um, but it was the 60s. Um, Another type of thing, you probably can't see this too, we have admissions papers going back into the 1880s. And we use these a lot for people either asking for genealogy, people writing about people who went to school here. Eudora Welty, for some reason, the well-known short story novelist from Mississippi came up here to go to undergraduate school. And you know, her admissions papers say where she lived. They give her street address, what her father was, he was in life insurance, things like that. These again are no longer being produced in paper. They're only in a database in the admissions office. How long they'll be kept is an open question. Again, they'll probably be put into some type of a data warehouse. Will we be able to produce this type of thing for people 50 years from now? But in some ways, will we need to? I mean, probably this type of information about all of us is out there in the world someplace anyway. So will it be as important in the future? It's a good question. But it's the type of thing that we deal with a lot, and it's changing as we transition from a paper world into a digital world. Um, and these are lots of types of questions. We have discussions all the time with other university with units. I'm sure the Historical Society has these discussions with state agencies about how we deal with a transition into a digital world. Um, and as an aside, since we're talking about Eudora Welty, um, we get a lot of questions about women on campus. And a lot of people will say, like, my great grandmother went to school there in 1910. She must have been one of a handful of women on campus. And there have always been more women on campus than people tend to think. Um, not like today, where women outnumber men in most categories, but women were on campus by 1860. I mean, the university was founded in 1848. They weren't admitted quite the same as men until 1847. We can, it's a whole different story. 
But they've been on campus, and for even many early years. The photo's probably 1870s, maybe early 1880s, and you can see quite a few women there. And like I said, in 1920, it was about a third women. And so there have always been far more women on campus than people tend to think. Um, but one thing that being in a digital world has allowed us to do is be much more proactive about what we have and let people know what we have. Archives have tended to be very passive organizations, partly because it was hard to do much else. But you tended to collect things and then sort of sit there and hope that someone figured out that you existed and came in to use something. Um, and so the digital world has allowed us to put more things online, promote the types of things we have. Um, so we're lucky, the UW Digital Collections, which is headquartered in Memorial Library, started out probably 10 years ago or more as mostly a Madison campus unit to digitize collections. It then got money from system. It has now digitized millions of pages of materials, photographs, not just for us, but for other campuses around the state, for other organizations around the state. But we were early, all of our yearbooks are online, the alumni magazine, many 12 or 13,000 photos, a lot of information that people can get to digitally without having to come into the archives. Um, we've had some big projects. I know the Historical Society has had many large grant funded projects. And I use this as an example too, as sort of my title. We, the woman coming in for Stanford, for example, the first thing she said was, is that available digitally? Can I just get it from home? And the answer to most of that is no. And this is a good example for why. The Leopold archives are 26 pay, uh, cubic feet, so like again, those sort of banker boxes. Um, that was digitized with a federal grant. It was supposed to be a quick and dirty project. We were supposed to add no additional metadata, subject information, anything. And that took $220,000 and took two and a half years to do. Um, as I tell people, everyone thinks digitization should be quick, easy, and cheap. And it's none of those things if you do it well. I would say, you know, we're not going to Best Buy and buying an $80 scanner and slapping stuff on it and doing things. These things take a lot of time and effort to do. But on the other hand, this used to be our most heavily used collection in paper, and now people use it all over the world because they can get to it electronically. But as, you know, there are good and bad things about all of this. This is actually um, Leopold's last entry in his journal from the morning of April 21st, 1948, the day that he died, fighting a forest fire or a fire on his neighbor's property up in his shack near Baraboo. Um, but a lot of people tend to assume that when you scan a handwritten page like this, somehow magically that transfers into typewritten text that you can search and find. And guess what? That doesn't actually happen. Someone was, uh, sent me an email a couple of days ago and said, like, I'm looking for this quote and I can't find it and it ought to be there. It was there, but it's in a handwritten manuscript. And you have to go look at the manuscript and then look through to see it. And so I'm sure a lot of people miss things because everyone assumes that you can just go in and search like Google and it'll all magically show up. And not everything works that way. Um, it has also allowed us to what I call create or repackage content, things that we know people are interested in, we get asked about, or that we think people will be interested in. So we can put that up for people. This is an early website that we did. Um, I had a library school student work on it with me about protests and social action in Madison in the 20th century. Um, it gets hit a lot. It's just a basic timeline of some major events, but it allows us to put up major events. It allows us to include photographs, clips from oral histories, documents, so that people can see these things online. And we get lots of questions from this. Um, actually, someone yesterday from Germany who was doing something for German school children on colonialism, and they wanted some anti-Columbus Day protest photos, and we have one from 1992 that they want to use. Um, so again, these things get used all over the world, and we can sort of create this content and put it up for people. Um, we've had a graduate student from the library school working us for us for the last year. He has been working part-time for the Historical Society also. Um, there he was working partly on the Summer of 64 project. For us, he did this website, which will be changing in a couple weeks when we change our new website, on early African-American presence on campus. And so that's our first African-American graduate, who was William Nolan, who was in the class of 1875. Um, and so we know people are interested in this. We'd like to do more of this type of thing, and it's difficult to do. Um, it's hard to ferret out. People always ask you, like, you should know, you know, who was the first Asian American female graduate student in chemistry. It's like, <laughs> nobody keeps records like that. <laughs> um, and for many of these things, until it became an issue in the 60s, the university didn't. We have a letter from President Harrington, someone asking us, you know, how many black faculty members, staff, uh, students do you have? And he said, I can't tell you, because we don't keep those records. We can start 
start keeping those records and then we can tell you, but we don't have them now. Um, so we hope to do a lot more of this, but it takes more time um, than people tend to think it would. Um, some of these are just fun. Um, we did this one probably 10 years ago or so. It gets looked at a lot around, we keep hoping we will be able to change the title of this, but damn it, we have not been able to. Um, I'm over that, don't worry about it. Um, but I do think they'd be better if they brought back those socks. I, mean, I really, um, you have to. Um, um, the oral history program, Troy Reeves is our oral historian. And um, again, we have 1,400 or so oral histories. We've, been, we've digitized them all. We now have the ability to sort of package those, create groupings of them. So like you can see various ones we have here, Badger Village, Madison LGBT community, Sterling Hall bombing. Um, Sterling Hall, on the 40th anniversary, we did sort of a story core thing in Memorial Library, got 90 or so people to give short memories of their memories of Sterling Hall. We've done a bunch of these mini movies, which is what is down at the bottom, that have sound and photo and podcasts. And we get questions from other campuses, from students in National History Day interested in Sterling Hall bombing. And they can often get enough of what they want just from these sites. They don't have to necessarily come to Madison to get things. So it's been very useful to create these types of materials for us. Um, We've also been doing a lot with social media as a way of getting out messages about what we do and how we do it. Um, we have a lot of things. We have a Tumblr post that we use just as kind of fun things that we find, either a photo like this was posted on Monday. If you can't read it, it says, acid, wa ah, acid wash jeans and puffy poo uh, permed hair must be the 90s. Yeah. Um, and these you know, get sent out and they get tweeted around all over the place and people like them. Sometimes we do bigger stories. Sometimes it's just a photo like that that we think is interesting. Um, we've used Flickr a lot. One thing that Flickr lets us do, um, again, sort of good and bad things of digitization. You can put 50 or 60,000 photos online. And we have people, I know schools that have done that. But you know, if someone comes up to you and says, like, oh, I'm interested in looking at old photos about Madison, you go like, here are 50,000 of them. They go, uh, <laughs> what do I do with that? Um, so this allows us to create small sets of anywhere from 10 to 50 photos around a topic or around an event, an anniversary. We send them out. They're often picked up by university communications or the alumni associates. They go all over the place. Though on the top row, you can see there's one called Here No More. I had a student do that a couple of years ago because people are always interested about things on campus that don't exist anymore. And again, if they don't exist, you probably don't know about them to look for them. Um, then the Alumni Association did an article in their magazine and on Wisconsin about buildings that don't exist. So people are always interested, whoops. People are always interested in, you know, there was a toboggan run that went from where Liz Waters is today down onto the lake. There was a ski jump on Bascom Hill that went down onto the lake that from 1919 into the 50s when it moved to Hoyt Park for a while. But again, if you don't know that exists, you have no reason to go look for that. So it's a way for us to get things out that people might not necessarily know are there, but they find interesting. And you never know. This is one we did probably four or five years ago on student housing. We tweeted out at the beginning of every semester when students move into dorms. It's been hit, I don't know if you can see that, it's almost 18,000 times. It was picked up by the Daily Mail in the UK a couple of years ago, and they did a story about housing at Madison. So you never know who is going to be interested in what they're going to do. Um, but you know, they're fun photos, a record party, a Barnard Hall dorm room. And for some of the young people in the audience, you used to have these things called cords that were connected to telephones. Um, some of you might remember that. Uh, most students today don't. <laughs> um, so where does that leave us at the moment? Um, we're in this interesting transitional period between analog and digital materials. We will probably be in that world for quite a while. A lot of archivists think we've probably lost anywhere from 10 to 15 years of data just because people haven't kept things like email. They haven't had the tools to keep it. Um, and sometimes keeping it, keeping can be more difficult than you think. We were talking to former provost DeLuca, who just retired went back to teaching. He has, he says, and he's a scientist, I assume he knows, somewhere between three and five terabytes of email and other materials from his um, administration. So even if you keep that, and we would never probably put that online, you would still probably have to talk to the archives or come to actually search through it. But how do you search all of that? How do you make sense of it? How do you then present that to someone, print it, email it to them? Um, we're increasingly dealing with things that were never on paper. Again, like the catalog now, which isn't 
available in paper. So how archives, archives are changing very much. Um, I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves we never kept everything. You know, if you look at the university from 1900, we only have a very few faculty members' papers. We don't have a lot. I think now we just kind of know more about what we're not keeping, and so it makes us feel worse. Um, <laughs> but you know, all archives are struggling with this. How we work from you know how we how we save websites, how we save social media. We saved Biddy Martin's Twitter feed when she left campus because we thought it might have interesting things about her trying to separate the campus from UW system. But it's like typical Twitter. You only hear half the conversation, and 90% of it is like, oh, I'm taking the dog out for a walk, or go Badgers, beat Iowa. You know, um, <laughs> how important is that? So it's a very interesting world for archivists to live in um, and try to figure out how things are going to work in the future. Um, if you ever want to use us, we are in Steenbach Library on campus. We don't have great hours. We're only open 8 to 4.30 during the week, but you can come in, talk to us, email us. We do phone questions. We actually do actual old-fashioned mail questions. Um, for those of you, our website will be changing. So if you go on to look for us, it's probably easiest to just Google UW-Madison archives, and you'll find us. But the website will look like this in a week or so. For those of you who like visual representations, if you don't know where Steenbach Library is, um, <laughs> we're just to the left of that building. So. Um, how many people recognize where that is? A couple, a few of you. That's the dean's house. It was built for the dean of the College of Agriculture. The photo is probably 1897. Um, today, it's sort of right in the middle of that photograph. There's what looks like a little green putting green to the right of the tennis courts. That's where that is today. So um, if you want to see us, that's where we are. So, um, <laughs> so thanks for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. So. Um, some of them have. I mean, there are a couple. The, the Mossy program and the Harvey Goldberg Center have a lot of those lectures that people remember from the 60s. Others, it tends to be some people were captured because they did radio programs, School of the Air types of programs. We do have a lot of those, um, but it's fairly hit and miss as to what we have. But we have a lot of professors' things. Again, it's just a matter of digitizing them and getting them out into the world to do. But there's quite a few. Um, yeah. Hi, Joyce. Hello, Hi, Joyce. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, all the resources that are available to us in that archive, you are the greatest. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. Well, thank you, Joyce. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with, of course, what we're all concerned about, mm -hmm. the cut back from mm -hmm. university, yeah. and uh, how valuable these, uh, these records are mm -hmm. for people. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping not. We're a part of the general library system. Our budget is staying at least steady for next year. We're not getting cuts. We're not getting position cuts. I know some of the other archives in the UW system are. So for the moment, we're getting cut. We have, we have had, we lost a halftime position that worked in the oral history program. So there are some things that um, we could use. But I mean, in terms of we certainly haven't been hurt any worse than the rest of the library system. And I think, I think libraries in general and our library system, Ed, I will say, are, feel very strongly that archives and special collections are important to the university. We have a lot of unique materials. And they feel strongly about supporting those materials and helping digitize those materials. So I feel pretty confident about um, where we are at the moment. We're like everyone else. We could obviously use more money. But I think we're, we're pretty good shape. I just have a little story to tell about the University Archives and why I loved him so much, so this might be interesting to you. Um, before I met him, my husband was in the University of Wisconsin marching band for four years in the 1960s and played clarinet. And he had a, a band jacket. And so over the years, I'd say, well, look at these stories about 
the days in the, in the van. Mm -hmm. We went to the 1963 Rose Bowl, by the way, oh, yeah. which was one of the most famous Rose Bowls ever, yeah. to find out. So I had a, a personal mission one year of giving him this amazing Christmas present because he claimed he had no memories of that Rose Bowl, no pictures, <laughs> no images, nothing. Because he was too tired, because he was too whatever. So I went to the University Archives. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I found out about the University Archives, and I went there and I spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. sat there with the white gloves, going through yeah. photos, um, yeah. folders and folders of photos. Mm -hmm. And to my absolute delight, there were lots and lots of photos yeah. of the 1963 Rose Bowl. Yeah. So I put together a Christmas album for him, a memory oh, album oh, of the Rose Bowl, and found lots of other treasures. Mm -hmm. And in the process of going through the photos, imagine I'm sitting there and I just literally had an intake of breath. There's photos from my husband, this is Clarence, <laughs> getting on and off the plane and at the Rose Bowl practice field. So that's really amazing. Yeah. And so a couple of months ago, we donated his yeah, jacket to we the have. University Archives. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. We, <laughs> it's very cool to have a jacket. And, and I might say one of the Flickr albums that I was saying is on the 63 Rose Bowl that we recently did, and that's been looked at a lot. Well, thank you so much. This is just a great program. I'm sorry I don't have a story. I'm actually asking you a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, you have a lot of regrets about having been able to digitize so many of the records. Yeah. Online from wherever it is in the world. And my question is um, are you able to see what people are asking you for and be, in order to be able to figure out what people are going to want? Um. Often we can. I mean, just through reference questions that we get from things. But it does kind of divorce you a little bit from that. And you can sort of get usage statistics on sort of general usage statistics. But those often don't tell you very specifically what people are looking at. So it does in some ways. I mean, you can put up the Leopold papers and you can say, oh, yeah, those are being used a whole lot. But you can't really tell what parts of them or even our other things. You can't really tell if everyone's looking at the 1964 yearbook or if they're looking at the 1901 yearbook. And so it does make it a little bit more difficult to figure out exactly. I think we go a lot on just reference questions we get asked for, things that we know people are asking for, classes we talk to, what people are interested in, and try to sort of work off of that. Um, yeah. If we hurry, we might squeeze through the last two questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for coming today. Sure. So if someone with a connection to the yeah. university thinks their stuff ought to be in mm -hmm. the archives and yeah. don't know about it yet, mm -hmm. one, do you have a process for intake? And two, do you encourage people to underwrite the acceptance of their papers? Um, we have not done that, but that's a good idea. <laughs> um, Mostly we just ask people to talk to us. Um, we go out and talk to a lot of faculty members and go to their houses or their offices and look at things. Other people often will just send us email and say, I'm cleaning out my grandmother's attic and I found these things. Are you interested in them? And so we get a lot of materials that way. Um, we haven't so much yet asked about you know, people funding, but um, our fundraiser from the foundation for the library is sitting at a table over there. So <laughs> we could take that back as a suggestion. It's actually a good idea. So. That's it. You touched on a little bit the challenges you have with different types of media. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could um, just expand on that a little bit, talk about some types of media that you might not be able to read anymore, mm -hmm. maybe even mm -hmm. early digitizing work yeah. that the archives have done, and then has yeah. now been lost because of different changes. Yeah, we, so far we don't have a lot of that happening, although we do have, if you saw in there, you know, like small disks you can still read with like USB machines, larger, like the five, I always get it wrong, five and a half, five and a quarter inch floppies, very difficult to find machines to read those and get anything off of them. Um, one of the things we have there look like um, albums, so they're actually transcription disks, they're these 16 inch albums. We have 7,000 of them, mostly from WHA um, radio programs. We're actually trying to get one digitized now because someone's looking for his grandfather's voice, who was a faculty member in the 40s and died very young in a car accident. Um, the music library used to be able to digitize them. We have a student who used to work there who's trying to do that. There's one person in town who can jerry-rig equipment <laughs> to try to do those. Um, Someone actually at a foundation town recently asked us about, we were talking about them, they said, oh, we might be able to fund that. What would that cost? We said, well, we have 7,000, that's 14,000 sides. The last estimate we got for outsourcing was $50 a side. So if you have $700,000, we'd be happy to digitize them. And they said, oh, 
okay. Um. <laughs> so um, a lot of that stuff is just a lot more expensive than people think. And like discs, you often don't know what's on them. So you can spend $100 to get a Wang disc digitized, but who knows what's on that, and do you want to spend that much money to do it? So it, it's a very difficult thing with all sorts of, and we have everything. We have wire recordings. We have dictaphone belts from the 70s. We've got just huge amounts of things to work with. So it's a, it's a very big issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone with the $700,000, come on up. Meeting's adjourned.